Hello, everyone. Thank you. So this is Anne Gary, Chief Strategy Officer and Lead Scientist at the Natural Capital Project. Thank you so much for joining us for the second installment of our new series, Natural Capital Conversations. We've got a great panel today on cultural ecosystem services connected to water. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Natural Capital Project, we partner, we pioneer the science, technology, and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. We're a partnership centered at Stanford University with five core partners shown on this slide here and a network of many more because we can't do this work without each one of you. This series is the Natural Capital Conversations, which is the newest addition to our virtual programming. And we started this series because we missed the connections that we had with so many of you at our annual Natural Capital Symposium at Stanford. These conversations are designed to spark engaging discussions, learn from each other's experiences and promote new connections uh, with old and new collaborators. These events feature everything from climate smart coastal planning to the cultural ecosystem services that we will feature today. We will have a recording of this webinar available on our YouTube channel and also a copy of the slides presented today will be in a thank you email sent to you after the event. During the webinar, please use the question and answer box for questions for the panel discussion at the end of the, um, after the two presentations and use the chat box for webinar logistics or technical assistance. The schedule for this morning or afternoon or evening, whatever your time zone is, is next. Uh, I will introduce Dr. Um, Alejandra Echeverri, who's a postdoc with Natural Capital Project. She's currently working on better ways to integrate biodiversity and ecosystem services into national development policies, specifically in Colombia and Costa Rica. She's a broad thinker about the connections between nature and people and has put together two great panels, today's and then a follow-up one on February the 16th on a subject that's near and dear to my heart, cultural ecosystem services. These are the intangible benefits that people derive from our interactions with nature that are absolutely central to the rich and diverse connection between nature and human well being. So, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ale. Uh, thank you, Anne, for that awesome introduction. So, today I'm calling from uh, the Bay Area in California. And I want to recognize that these are the ancestral lands of the Muwekma Oholoni tribe, where our academic institution sits. So we offer our grateful appreciation for the opportunity to live and work here. And we celebrate the culture and perseverance of the Muwekma Oholoni people and their strong identity. So Anne mentioned this. Uh, so about cultural ecosystem services and what they are. So they are defined as ecosystems contributions to the non-material benefits, capabilities and experiences that arise from human ecosystem relationships. I know our audience, which is very plentiful today, is very familiar with this framework of ecosystem services. Many of you work on this field. We probably read your papers, we cite you or we have worked with you. And um, we know them by this uh, typology of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So some are supporting services like photos photosynthesis, some are provisioning services, the ones that we are most used to studying, like uh, the nature benefits that people gives us in terms of like wood or food or clean water. And the regulating services like uh, carbon storage or clean air. So what are these cultural services um, also now called um, cultural benefits? So these are the, the benefits that we derive from nature, like artistic inspiration, like recreation. And these have been, um, oh, next slide, please. So 
they remain less studied compared to the other categories of services. So in a recent review published by Kai Chan and Terry Satterfield, actually not too long ago, a few months ago, they did a scan of the literature of ecosystem services and how the trends have gone through time. And this graph, I think, shows the proportion of studies that address the different kinds of services. So we'd see that overall ecosystem services research has grown over time as we expected, but still the social or the cultural benefits here shown in pink are less studied compared to the biophysical services like pest control, carbon storage, and the others that I mentioned. So next slide, please. So today I wanted to put together this panel with two awesome researchers on cultural ecosystem services connected to water. Um, first, we have Professor Rebecca Hale. Rebecca Hale is an assistant professor at Idaho State University. Her research addresses the interfaces of biogeochemistry, hydrology, and society at local and regional scales. Her current research addresses the biogeochemistry of urban social ecological systems. And her talk titled Cultural Ecosystem Services Provided by Rivers, a Social Media Analysis, will give us some ideas on how her team is going about incorporating these cultural services in the study of rivers. And this is something that I think um, at NATCAP we can learn a lot about. We have a lot of hydrologists and ecosystem services modelers modeling the biophysical services of rivers. So I, I speak on behalf of our team and the audience. We're all very much looking forward to learning from you. We also have Rocio Lopez de la Lama. She's a PhD candidate at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at the University of, Research of British Columbia. And her research explores people's relationships with nature through a relational values lens. In particular, she's interested in understanding how people's relationship with nature might motivate and foster the creation of privately protected areas in Peru her home country. Rocio's talk titled Reconnecting with the Past and Anticipating the Future, a, re a review of fisheries derived cultural ecosystem services in pre-Hispanic Peru, will also teach us a lot about something that I had not seen before in the cultural ecosystem services scholarship, which is applying that framework to ancient civilizations to help us understand how, per how Peruvians um, have built their identity. So, um, I also look forward to learning from Rocio, and I hope that you all enjoy this two talks. So I'm going to give it over to Rebecca, and we'll have the two talks, and then we'll do the Q&A together. So thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Alejandra, for the, um, for the kind of introduction and for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, so first, I'll, I'll acknowledge my co-authors, Elizabeth Cook, who is an assistant professor at Barnard College, and Brian Beltran, who is the science director at the Heart of the Rockies Initiative. Um, and this is some work we've been doing over the past years, focused on seeing if we can use social media data to quantify social uh, cultural ecosystem services at landscape scales. So where do ecosystem services come from? Um, a dominant paradigm in the field is that ecosystem services um, it's this ecosystem service um, cascade. Sorry, I'm trying to move this thing so I can actually see my slide. Um, there we go. Um, where ecosystem structures are producing ecosystem functions, which then provide services, and those kind of cascade down to humans and, and provide human well being. Um, and this is really a supply side model of ecosystem services, and it presupposes that we can predict ecosystem services. Um, and human benefits based on the structure of ecosystems. And, you know, increasingly we've been um, seeing efforts to quantify demand for ecosystem services as well, with the associated recognition that the, the services that people obtain um, from ecosystems depends at least in part on the perspectives and the perspective perceptions and the needs of the people obtaining those services. So some ecosystem services are going to be very directly related to ecosystem structure and function, such as carbon sequestration, um, while others are likely to be less related, such as recreation or sense of place. Um, and in order to understand 
especially cultural ecosystem services, we really need to understand um, how people use and experience ecosystems. So Alejandra gave a brief introduction to cultural ecosystem services. They're, they're a really important um, category of services. They can be economically important. So this image um, here on the right, um, or my left, um, shows that um, cultural ecosystem services can be big business. So this is a, a picture of an angler in Henry's Fork, a river in Idaho, where fishing and boating is valued at almost $30 million a year. Um, but those fishing at Henry's Fork are getting more than just food and they're doing more than just stimulating the economy. Um, they're also getting, uh, they're recreating, they're gaining a sense of place, they're sharing their cultural heritage and their identity and so on. And as we focus more on um, quantifying landscape patterns of ecosystem services, we're realizing that cultural ecosystem services are really challenging to, to quantify at landscape scales. We can't remote sense cultural services and they're much less likely to be directly related to structure. And the best ways of measuring cultural ecosystem service provisioning is through things like surveys and interviews, which are really labor intensive, and expensive, and therefore difficult to implement at large spatial scales. You know, we have some opportunities too. Um, people, including myself, voluntarily share a lot of information about what they're thinking on social media, often with, with spatial information as well. And this can, um, can provide an inexpensive and readily available source of information for quantifying um, cultural ecosystem services. So photo sharing services such as Flickr, Instagram, Panoramio have been used to assess where people are obtaining cultural ecosystem services across the landscape. So um, first image is uh, from a paper in PNAS that illustrated the use of Flickr to understand cultural ecosystem services across Europe. And others have found that user days to um, national parks and other natural attractions is um, estimated from geotagged uh, Flickr images is well correlated with empirical visitation estimates. And if you're familiar with the Natural Capital Project INVEST model, this is the, the relationship that's used to estimate visitation to an ecosystem um, in, that, in that framework. So other research has looked to photo sharing services to understand not only where people are understanding cultural or obtaining cultural ecosystem services, but which services are being provided in those places. So this study um, from Patagonia classified photographs from Flickr and Panoramio according to the cultural ecosystem services highlighted by each image. So they classified the images into these four categories, aesthetic values, local identity, existence, and recreation. And this adds a really great richness to our understanding of cultural ecosystem services at, at landscape scales. But manually coding each image is very labor intensive and it's also you know, quite subjective. Most importantly, I think, though, is that these categories are predefined by the researcher, and so they might not capture the full range of meaning that a photographer can intend um, as, as they're experiencing the landscape. So fortunately, we don't have to guess at what a social media user was thinking when they took a photograph because they can tell us. When people upload a photograph to Flickr, for example, they often include a good deal of additional information. So um, this photo here, for example, has a title and detailed description of what the photograph is, as well as these tags um, about the image. And some of the tags here, it, they're probably too small to read, but some of them include scenic, water, reservoir, landscape. And it's this text that's associated with the photograph that we're exploring in this research. So the idea is that how people describe the picture that they've taken can give us insight into how they're perceiving the landscape, including what cultural ecosystem services they're obtaining. So today I'm going to present results from a test case where we used Flickr metadata, so specifically the words and the spatial information associated with photographs to explore cultural ecosystem services provided by rivers in Idaho. So we restricted our analysis, we pulled data from Flickr, we restricted our analysis to photographs that were geotagged within 200 meters of a river, um, and we used this data set to ask three questions. One, what cultural ecosystem services are people obtaining from rivers in Idaho? How do those specific services relate to ecosystem characteristics? So do we find any evidence of this cascade model? And then three, do these services bundle in ways that parallel traditional cultural ecosystem services? And everything I'm presenting today and more is, um, is um, in, this, in this paper we published a couple of years ago. Um, in the ecological indicators. And so I'll kind of point you there for, for more methodological um, background and detail. 
So the first thing we did with our data set was characterize the frequency of different words in the data set. So we did this first by identifying categories of cultural ecosystem services from the literature. And then we developed a set of about 260 words or sets of words that represented those different services. And so some of those were pulled from the literature and some of them were um, obtained by literally looking at every single word that was in our data set. And then we coded our image data set so that we have presence and absence of each of the, these 260 sets of terms for each image. So this figure here um, shows the five most common words in each of these categories. So each of the cultural ecosystem service categories is along the x-axis. And then the Y shows the proportion of images in our data set that, um, that had each of these words. And note the, the log scale here. So there's quite a bit of variation. Some words are very common and some are um, very rare. So what we find here is that we have um, good representation. All, all of these categories were represented in the data set, um, but there's a strong bias towards existence and recreation values. Um, and this is likely because some services are, are less likely to be the subject of a photograph that's public, um, posted publicly online. But it's also because some of these categories are extremely difficult to operationalize with the data set, um, such as sense of place and cultural diversity. It's really hard to find you know, an, an individual word that's unimpeachably um, associated with something like cultural heritage. So there's, there's some limitations in this data set. So we have all these words. Can we relate them to ecosystem structure? And rather than doing 260 individual regressions for each word, um, we used a redundancy analysis, which I'll refer to as an RDA. An RDA is basically an expanded regression. So we have multiple predictor variables that we're using to um, predict multiple response variables. So in this case, our predictor variables are a number of environmental characteristics. So we use a variety of land cover metrics, land ownership, and also variables related to access. So um, fishing and boating access, campgrounds, things like that. And then we use those to predict our cultural ecosystem services. And again, we're using these words as proxies for these services. And here we restricted our analysis actually to the words that were relatively common across the landscape. So we weren't having things driven by something that was very rare. I'm gonna kind of build this figure a little bit. Um, this, this shows these two axes are our our ordination, you can think about this plot as, as similar to any kind of ordination plot. We've collapsed the variation in our predictor variables onto these two axes, and you'll see um, not very many predictors here. These are the predictors that came out as significant in this analysis. So um, on the first axis, we have this um, gradient from more remote reaches um, over here that are associated with um, the distance to the nearest road um, over to um, reaches that have more private land ownership and more developed land cover. And then our second axis um, describes a gradient from, again, more remote reaches and then areas that have more scrub and grassland cover and more developed land cover. So then we can add our words, our services on here and see how they relate to these environmental predictors. Um, and essentially we can read this as a spatial association in this plot being um, basically statistical association. So um, for example, boat and wild here are associated with remoteness and negatively associated with private and developed land cover. Um, cycle and road, in contrast, are more associated with private land ownership and developed land cover, and recreation um, is associated with forest, um, forest service land. So the bottom line here is we have some structure here. We're, we're not explaining nothing, um, but we're not explaining very much. Um, so the R squared of this model is 0.14. And, and part of this is, is, might be because of data limitations. Um, but I also think part of it is because we don't know anything about who these people are. As I noted in the introduction, the cascade model is really limited for thinking about cultural ecosystem services because the human side of the equation is so important. And I, I think we're really seeing that here. So we can estimate what people are getting from the landscape, but it's not strongly related to the structure of the landscape. Um, also note, I'm not gonna show these data, but we did this with the broader um, categories as well. And while we were able to uh, identify a significant model, it explained even, even less of the variation, only about 6%. So here we're finding that if you wanna connect things to the landscape, being more specific, um, more, um, yeah, being more specific can, can help you. So these classical categories of cultural ecosystem services weren't well associated with landscape features. And we were curious if we could create different groupings uh, or bundles of services based on how they're distributed across the landscape and what environmental features they associate with. 
So we did a hierarchical cluster analysis of words using uh, the scores from those axes from the RDA. So we're not grouping services conceptually, recreation or aesthetics, but by um, what environmental variables they associate with and how, how they're distributed across landscapes. So the clusters that an associate that resulted from um, this analysis over here on the right um, were really distinct from traditional categories. So we had two clusters that really were associated with specific activities. So this first cluster, the words are river, boat, recreation, camp, and wild. And this describes a very specific um, activity that people do quite a bit in, spe in specific places in Idaho. So a lot of um, wilderness, whitewater rafting. Um, and this other cluster, travel, cycle, and road, um, again, is kind of a, a mode of interaction, how people are interacting with the rivers, um, this idea that they might be viewing them from the road. And then the other two clusters really describe kind of a, a mixture of existence and aesthetic values. So cluster two of this uh, beautiful existence. Um, so a, a lot of words describing a view, bridge, uh, plants, water, animals, and park. And then cluster three, um, we have a lot to go on here and naming it. Uh, there are two words associated with this cluster, mountain and sun. And so that is um, what we call the cluster, mountain sun. But again, this mixture of existence and, um, and aesthetic values. So this really isn't typically how we group cultural ecosystem services. And I think there's some important implications when we try to map them out and try to make predictions about where services are happening over space. The more specific we can be, uh, the better. So before I wrap up, I wanted to give just a couple of short examples of other things that we can do with these data. So the first is from some work we did with the Salmon Chalice National Forest District in Idaho. We used Flickr to do a cultural ecosystem service assessment for their district. But we were also to compare, able to compare our analysis with their visitor use survey results to assess bias. And so uh, this figure is showing um, our results in orange and the blue from the survey. And um, I won't spend too much time here. The key take homes here is that Flickr overestimates natural feature viewing, um, so things that are more likely to be photographed. Um, and it underestimates more active recreational activities um, that are less likely to be photographed and also as underestimates extractive activities. So hunting and gathering that are much less likely to be geotagged and posted publicly um, on the internet. And then a second quick story I'd like to share is some work that Brad Beltran has been leading using species distribution modeling approaches to model cultural ecosystem services in the high divide region of Idaho and Montana. And what we get from these is this spatial um, kind of continuous spatial predictions of the probability of CES provisioning based on landscape structure. And what I think is just super neat about these preliminary results is that we have these really different spatial patterns across these. And again, this was words that we were modeling here. So camping over here and hiking are both subsets of recreation, but when we model them independently, we get really different um, spatial patterns. So showing us that combining the spatial and the content information from these images can be a really powerful tool for estimating the potential for um, cultural ecosystem service provisioning across the landscape. So it's going to take months. Um, one, um, three of these services identified for Flickr were significantly, but very weakly related to ecosystem structure. So understanding the cultural aspects of demand are going to be really important for understanding cultural ecosystem service provisioning. This is Probably not really surprising. Um, and second, the broad, cat, the broad categories of, of cultural services were less useful for linking to the landscape. The more specific we were, um, the better. So where landscape structure matters, it does so in very specific ways. And then finally, I didn't spend too much time focused on these, but there are a lot of biases and limitations associated with these data sets. Who is providing the data? What they are choosing to share, share publicly? And we still have to, you know, to some extent, guess what people are thinking. And so analyses using social media data um, are really powerful, but at, when we use them to support decision-making, I think we need to really carefully examine and ideally quantify the biases and limitations when we interpret, and especially when we apply those results. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion later. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Um, so now, Rocio, if you can please share your screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. 
Thanks for the introduction, Alejandra. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of the Metro Capital Conversations. And as mentioned last week, one type of dependence with marine ecosystems are cultural ones. And within that context is that our project aims to shed light onto the historical ties people, in particularly early coastal Peruvians, had with marine and coastal ecosystems and the transformative role that such cultural benefits had in favor of Peruvians' development. Before starting, just a quick overview of the presentation's outline, starting from what we understand by cultural ecosystem services and their relevance in the marine context, to presenting Peru as a fascinating case study for the exploration of cultural benefits. Uh, to begin with, marine and coastal ecosystems have been and still are key for our development as a society, particularly in the global south through small-scale fisheries, where their contribution to food security and economy are of vital importance. While many have speculated that such activities are central to the provision of cultural benefits, such as cultural identity and heritage values, there are key information gaps regarding small-scale fisheries contribution to societies and their historical importance. However, Marine ecosystems are suffering from intense degradation worldwide. This degradation does not only affect marine and coastal ecosystems capacity to provide regulating, provisioning, and supporting ecosystem services, but also cultural ones that arise from our relationship with marine and coastal ecosystems. As Alejandra and Rebecca have already defined what we understand by cultural services, I won't go into the definition. However, it is important to mention that most of what we know regarding cultural services is limited to terrestrial ecosystems, mainly in Europe and North America, and chronologically to the most recent past decades. This leaves critical information gaps for understanding cultural services in global South nations and how these human nature relationships have changed through time, particularly within the marine and coastal context. Past relationships between people and nature may be explored in older literature, such as anthropology and geography, However, that literature has not been used for deepening our understanding of how our relationship with nature have changed throughout time and how those changes affect what we deem appropriate of such interactions now. Moreover, a long-term perspective of human nature relationships may allow us to better comprehend long-term environmental cycles and complex socio-ecological processes. So within this context, our aim was to showcase the transformative role of fisheries for early coastal rulers in Peru highlighting how this activity allowed for the development of dynamic and reciprocal relationships between humans and marine and coastal ecosystems. Our main focus is the pre-Hispanic period, which starts around 13,000 years before our current era, which is the date of the first evidence of humans in the Peruvian coast, until 1532 of our current era, which is the year of the Spanish conquest of Peru. But why Peru? Until last year, according to FAO's uh, statistics, Peru was the world's fifth largest fishing nation based on land lease, mainly anchovy fisheries, and more than half of the Peruvian population, around 15, 20 million people, lives in the coastal regions, where seafood plays an important role in economy, food security, and people's identity. As Peruvians, we are very proud of our ceviche. Moreover, Peru is a fascinating case study from a historical perspective, as it is home to one of the six oldest civilizations in the world, the Norte Chico civilization. Unlike other core civilizations that grew primarily based on agriculture, such as Mesopotamia or the Indus Valley, fisheries played a key part of the, in the early flourishment of the Andean civilizations. Consequently, traditional fisheries gain a new dimension of importance tightly linked to people's identities and traditions. Thus, all of these factors make Peru a great study, case, uh, case study for exploring cultural services through a historical lens, plus trying to revalue the role that small-scale fisheries had in our history. To identify cultural services, we conducted an extensive literature review focused on early coastal Peruvian settlements and cultures, as well as on ancient and traditional fishing practices. The sites you can see on the map as red triangles. Uh, to do so, we limited our scope, as I mentioned before, to when the humans first appeared on the Peruvian coast up until the Spanish colonization. We concentrated our efforts mainly on archeological data as this discipline can provide critical insights into the transformation of socio-ecological systems across time. By using specific keywords, we managed to identify and include 129 articles, both in English and Spanish, in our study. In order to make sense of all the data we were gathering, we decided to use Fish and Colleagues Framework from 2016. Based on such framework, which I will show you next, 
we identify broad themes and codes for our qualitative analysis. This framework approaches cultural services as relational and non-linear. By that, I mean that this framework acknowledges that cultural services are co-produced and co-created by people's relationships with their environmental uh, settings. Such dynamism can be transformative to the cultures at the societal scales, which is actively changing the way in which cultural meaning itself is derived from ecosystems. In this framework, environmental spaces, places in which people interact with other people and nature, and cultural practices, expressive and symbolic interactions between people and their environment, are mutually reinforcing cultural services through which cultural benefits arise. And here, cultural benefits can be understood as the dimensions of human well being that can be associated with interaction between nature and people. Finally, Fish uh, categorizes cultural benefits as capabilities, identities, and experiences. And these are the categories we use for understanding our data. So, what did we find? First, I will start on our environmental spaces findings. The seascape and landscape have changed significantly. This is something important to keep in mind before jumping into the different identified cultural benefits. Marine ecosystems along the Peruvian coast have experienced multiple environmental changes over the past few millennia before reaching current climatic conditions, mainly related to sea level stabilization, ecosystem productivity, and frequency of El Niño events. Thus, the current landscape we can see today is significantly different from what early coastal Peruvians had access to such as a wide range of coastal ecosystems that complemented each other very well in terms of providing food, water, and other key resources. Some of these ecosystems included dry forests, mangroves, salt marshes, wetlands, lagoon, among others. This explains the almost permanent coastal occupation by early Peruvians even before the development of agriculture. Sadly, many of these ecosystems are no longer there or, or are highly degraded. Second, interaction between the seascape and Peruvians have yielded marine cultural practices for at least 14,000 years. These cultural practices uh, first emerged from the most basic interaction between humans and the ocean, food procurement. These activities included gathering, hunting, fishing, diving, and so on. Due to the importance of fishing as a key step for building the human nature relationship, we, we elaborated a timeline focusing on the evolution of fisheries. In this timeline, you can see that the oldest evidence of primitive fishing Fishing dates back to 12,500 uh, years before our current era. Sadly, because of time, I cannot go into detail here, but please refer to our article to check out the timeline uh, if you like. However, I will do point that perhaps the most significant technological development for fishing communities in Peru were floating nets made from cotton. These nets increased productivity substantially as being more resistant and lighter to use. This occurred in the Norte Chico civilization, the one I talked about in the introduction, providing an important amount of nutritious small pelagic fish, mainly anchovies and sardines, for local people, which led to a food surplus. This surplus fostered the specialization between fisheries and agriculture, a key feature of complex societies. Okay, so before presenting our findings on, on cultural benefits, it is important to mention that we can only make inferences about ecosystems' cultural contributions to society through archaeological evidence found to date. Uh, in terms of capabilities, early coastal Peruvians experienced a community learning process regarding the extraction of marine natural resources. Evolution of traditional ecological knowledge from seafood gathering to cotton nets with floats took roughly 10,000 years. The resulting technological innovations around fisheries secured a surplus of seafood for coastal communities Allow, allowing local communities to develop complementary traditional knowledge systems on land, such as new cooking practices, seafood processing, and eventually trade with the Andean communities. Some examples of seafood processing can be found in La Paloma, where there is evidence of fish meal production. Here they found about 500 storage pits for fish meal, which allowed its consumption and distribution long after having done fishing. Another interesting site is San Jeronimo, south of Peru, where the Chidibaya people once lived. There is evidence that they would dry and smoke fish in circular sand field rock enclosures. In terms of skills regarding sailing, different types of vessels were eventually crafted to gain access to offshore marine resources and continue increasing fishery productivity. The first evidence of rafts made of reef date from 3,000 years ago, on a site where 50% of all seafood remains, remains correspond to blue sharks. So these ancient rafts were highly likely used for fishing sharks. Reed rafts then evolved into more complex structures, 
In this way, thanks to sailing, early Peruvians managed to use the ocean as a route for communication, breaking the barrier imposed by the coastal desert. In terms of identities, marine theme myths and rituals denote the importance of the ocean for spiritual purposes in Peruvian coastal societies. Some examples of these include the spiny oysters, or locally known as muyu, and sharks. Muyu was one of the most valuable possessions during pre-Hispanic times and even at the beginning of the colonial times. Muyu were imported from all the way from Ecuador, at least since 3,000 years ago, and were used for ceremonies that tried to predict the weather, particularly if an El Niño event would come that year. On the other hand, sharks were considered as sacred beings in multiple sites. In Huacapuquiana, which is located in Lima, shark meat was limited only for special occasions associated with human sacrifices, and only those from higher classes could eat them. The ceremonies had several depictions of shark in ceramics, textiles, and jewelry. Finally, in terms of experiences people had, I want to focus on those of spirituality and religiosity. Architecture was an essential conduit for expressing adoration for the sea. One site that deserves special attention is Pachacamac, located south of Lima. Pachacamac was a ritual site for over a thousand years, where different cultures would adopt the site. This long-term occupation was uncommon in the pre-Hispanic Andes, as people were always changing sites. There is evidence of seamless transition between four successive different cultures up to the Spanish conquest. Although there were some changes in re religious beliefs, the sea and marine elements remain as a central feature of its architecture. Okay, so before uh, wrapping up my presentation, here we have managed to identify historical cultural ecosystem services derived from the constant relationship between the seascape, coastal landscapes, and early coastal rulers in Peru, which generated dynamic and reciprocal relationships that fostered and the development of early coastal communities and cultures. Changes in the seascape and coastal ecosystems together with the ongoing evolution of cultural practices led to diverse cultural benefits that contributed to the advancement of complex and coastal societies. These benefits included capabilities, identities, and experiences that still shape how people, especially small-scale fishers, approach their relationships with the oceans today. Unfortunately, all of these relationships and interactions were negatively affected once colonial times began. As local communities turned to fisheries as a way to escape and isolate themselves from colonial rule, so all this technological development just stopped. Due to this break in the relationships between people and nature, it is imperative that current small-scale fisheries are seen as a 14,000-year legacy of the ancient relationships between Peruvians and the seascape. Small-scale fisheries to this date are not protected nor adequately managed, as they are considered less important, mainly in terms of revenue, when compared to industrial fisheries, which are huge. However, by letting small-scale fisheries to be unsustainable or to be an inadequate livelihood for people, Peruvians are losing part of their identity. Thus, that is why it is so important to use cultural benefits as key arguments when defending small-scale fisheries, as in that way, they are not only seen as an economic activity that provides food, but also as a cultural heritage that needs and deserves protection for all Peruvians. Uh, that's all I wanted to talk to you about today. And here is a link to our article in case you want to check out the timeline in more detail or, or the rest of our findings. And thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Rocio. So now I invite uh, Rebecca to turn on her video too. And we're going to start the panel discussion. We've had a lot of activity in the Q&A um, box. So people, if you still have questions, please type them there because we're moderating um, through that box. So I'm gonna start with a question from Althea to Rebecca that says, are you able to incorporate other languages besides English? I'm curious if posting say in Spanish might have different usages associated with pictures. Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, we had a few um, images in our data set that, had span that were in Spanish, um, but a very, a very small amount. Um, one of the things we would like to do in this future, one of the kind of study areas would like to do to kind of um, try to do a better job. And notice one of the other questions is kind of, I'm going to kind of combine the answers to these, um, is focusing on national parks, um, where we have more languages present. Um, 
and and where we could actually more kind of easily tie like folks from different nationalities and see what how that how that varies um, and really try to get at this question of like how does the user and the user's kind of cultural framework affect what they're um, what they're what they're getting from that landscape and so that's that's definitely something that's possible with these data sets. Um, this data set didn't have much to work with there. There was a little bit in Spanish, but not much. But that's definitely an area we're excited to do move forward into the future. Awesome. And this one is from Natalia uh, to Rocio. And it goes, Dear Rocio, based on the impressive current achievements and changes in Peru, what do you think is the next most important step on a way of building a sustainable future in harmony with nature for your country? What challenges might be faced? Oh, wow. That's a very <laughs> complex question. Uh, yeah. I don't, uh, well, Focusing on the on the seascape and small scale fisheries, we recently found that currently uh, small scale fishers are living under the poverty line, and they're like the state is not taking care of them, or they are not well organized socially to face the new economic challenges or even the pandemic. Right. So I think in order for us to have a sustainable uh, fisheries, because that's how Peruvians mainly access seafood. Uh, through small scale fisheries, uh, I think the basic step is start working towards sustainability and adequate manage management of these type of fisheries. Because so far we are seeing uh, severe indicators of overfishing. Um, every time now, small scale fishers have to go further and further away from the coast to fish. But yeah, I think, I think so. Uh, using science and information, we need to properly manage and care for small scale fisheries in order to have a, a better. Uh, future. Yeah. Um, awesome. And this one's also from Natalia Batu Rebecca. And it says During your research, did you notice any cultural ecosystem services specific to particular cultures, like different nationalities? Are they affecting ecosystem services in certain way? And this was related to a question I had, which is Do you think social media? is capturing the perceptions of a wide demographics or or no so over to you yeah um there's been there's been some research trying to quantify kind of like who actually uses social media and how biased it is whether it's biased towards different age groups or different um demographics um we um we didn't get so far in this in this analysis to look at who the users were that were posting photographs here. So we didn't weren't able to kind of say, well, these um, these people are are looking at, at these types of things. These people are looking at these things. Um, again, this is kind of a direction we'd like to go, focused on the national parks, where we might have a more um, diverse group of of users using those um, those ecosystems. Um, yeah, the, but. I, I don't have a good answer for like what the bias is, but I can guarantee you that it's biased that certain types of people are going to be using different types of media. Um, and so, you know, using a combination of media is going to be a good kind of way of trying to address that. And also, I think this should never really be, especially if you're applying it, it should not be used in isolation. You should be combining it with either other sources of social media or other on the ground methods to kind of quantify what those biases are and be able to adjust for them in the analysis. Yeah, I want to actually build on that question, probably addressing both of you, because your talks are a very nice complement. One, it's in North America, one is in South America, one studies present relationships, one studies past relationships, one uses quantitative methods, the other is more qualitative which is part of the reason why I wanted both of you to present, to show the audience that there are many ways of studying cultural uh, ecosystem services. So I was wondering if either of you could integrate the methods of the other talk or like other ways of doing things, what would have strengthened your studies? Um, so. I love that question. Um, I was thinking as I was, you know, putting this talk together that, you know, maybe there are um, landscape variables that are just, they're not captured in nat national data sets, right? Like everything we pulled was like a national land cover data set, a national 
land ownership data set, you know, access points from that are collated at national or state level. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are other ways of understanding space and landscape and, and that might be predictive in these models if they're, if it's more of like landscapes of meaning. Um, there was a great, um, blog the other day I, I can't remember what it, what it was um I'm not going to remember any of the details but it was basically like alternative ways of of mapping um using kind of oral histories and cultural histories and using that to like map the landscape and I think you could you know that would be a I think a really neat way of thinking about how can we think about this at large spatial scales and try to make predictions at large spatial scales while not just using um biophysical understandings of space, but also thinking about cultural understandings of space. Yeah, thank you, Ellie, for the question. And I think for, from my perspective, uh, I think it would be super interesting to actually start exploring uh, how people, like on their social media, right? Like every time they go to the beach or like even local communities who live on the beach, what are they taking pictures of or what they are talking about to see how much the seascape or like the ocean is important to them because from previous research we know that lots of coastal Peruvians actually are detached from the ocean and perhaps that's something that comes from colonial times because if you're if you have a house you have the beach on one side and the highway on the other people will like view the highway instead of the ocean and that's because where that's where development comes from like you can sell your products there so I think exploring that current relationship and what people value would be like a great addition to a lot of research. Awesome. Um, and this one is from Sydney to Rocio. And she says, thank you both for your presentations. Rocio, how might your findings be translated into the language of decision makers to inform and shape political strategies that would protect small scale fisheries and their, and their associated cultural services? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, there's there might be two components to it. First, because right now decision makers, they have the economic data, they have ecological data, but still they are not prioritizing small scale fisheries as they should. And perhaps by using this cultural heritage uh, language, then we could call their attention <clears throat> because we have Machu Picchu and that works really well, like it's well managed and protected and people value it. So perhaps that same kind of narrative we could use to design policy brief or talks with decision makers, but also thinking about Jennifer's jacket work, a bit of shaming, right? Like these decision makers are leaving this cultural heritage just go away. Are we gonna let, like, are we allowing them to do that? So I think maybe those two things could work. Great question. Uh, lots of activity in the Q&A box. <laughs> so this one's from Ling Ling to Rebecca. Which data sources did you use to study this cultural ecosystem services distribution modeling? And um, she's wondering how to determine choosing variables like cliff, recreation, private and developed and so on when connecting rivers and cultural services. Yeah, so we use the same data set, this Flickr data set for the um, high divide um, study. So same kind of thing. We pulled data from Flickr. We um, pulled out certain words and we looked at, um, we basically mapped words across the landscape. So we had the presence of words across space. And then um, in that particular model, um, we were using some different environmental variables. Um, we used um, a human modification index. Um, which combines a lot of kind of uh, variables about the built environment and a topographic index, which kind of defines where you are in space. And those are kind of some of the big differences that came out between the hiking and the camping. Um, so it, you can identify whether words are more associated with being in valleys or ridges. Um, and so uh, that ended up um, really coming out in that analysis. And I'll also say that the, um, kind of the fit of those models was stronger than the models that we did with the, with the rivers. And so um, there actually was some pretty good um, relationships with that landscape structure. Um, and then how we chose the other ones, we wanted to get a, a range of variables that captured 
broadly ecosystem structure, so land cover variables, um, land ownership variables, and variables related to access and remoteness, because which is kind of tied to access. Are people able to get to those places? And um, so we we had a lot of variables that we that we pulled out for all these reaches, and the ones that I showed in that in that plot were the ones that that were retained in our best model. So we we tested a lot of variables, um, and those were the ones that ended up being most important. I hope that that clarifies that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and this one was not asked to Rocio, but I'm going to. Um, ask her because I know she studied this for her candidacy exam. So uh, this one's from Elizabeth Tamayo and it says, are cultural ecosystem services considerably more difficult to value economically compared to other services? Great, thank you for the question. Well, yes, <laughs> according to the literature, they are very hard to estimate, especially because what does this economic value tells you, right? If you're asking people uh, how important is their land to them or how much their value, their livelihoods, an economic estimate won't necessarily make sense. And some literature says, right, that even asking that question can offend or insult some people. So I think that's why it's so hard to actually value economically. Tourism, I think that's like it's more simple, right? Like you can estimate how much a ticket costs to this tourist attraction or how much people are investing into going all the way there. Uh, but more like nuances thing or like how people relate with nature. I think that's, that's more complicated. Uh, I was going to add to that, but I think you covered it. So <laughs> uh, uh, this one is from Ariani to Rebecca. Uh, thank you both for presenting your really interesting work. Um, Rebecca, how do you think your findings about cultural ecosystem services could feed into future landscape management in Idaho or more broadly? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I'll kind of pivot and, and talk about how I shared with uh, the National Forest when we did their the assessment for their district. I'll kind of talk about how we kind of framed that for them because they were doing it as part of their um, their planning process. And what I think is really um, useful about this kind of analysis is we can kind of pull out like what are the natural features that are important and that that are providing um, services and what are the, you know, the built features that are really critical for for actually allowing that access to happen to connect people to the environment. And, and the way that we talked about it with the forest um, was, was thinking about, well, you know, if we find out that people really like these types of features and there are additional types of features like that on the landscape that don't currently have access to them, perhaps you can, you know, provide access to those um, and find basically limitations um, to access that can, can that can increase the way that we um, that we in increase the, the provisioning of services. And in my mind, provisioning of, of cultural services means people need to access ecosystems. And so um, that is to me a big outcome of this is what are, how are people accessing them and, and what ways are they using them so that we can identify kind of what things are really popular and where there are opportunities to increase access. That's awesome. Thank you. I had a, a question that I've been thinking about for probably the past, I don't know, five years. So let's see what you guys think about this one is my own work on cultural services is very context specific and your talks as well. Um, so I know a lot of people in the audience are doing global models of uh, ecosystem services. So like things for like carbon storage, we have global maps. And at least in our organization, we're thinking about this, um, what is a global indicator of cultural services? Or maybe the answer is there are none. We have to keep doing this very context dependent um, study. So, well, so two questions. One, do you think there's something that we could use as a global proxy for cultural services or like, if so, what is it? Or no, we should stick to doing local studies like the three of us do. 
That's a really hard question. <laughs> um, I have no idea, and I haven't I haven't really thought about that. I guess my initial kind of thinking as you were talking was, you know, we as you as you kind of increase the scale, the spatial scale of your analysis, you lose detail and you lose richness, right? Like if you want to do things at, at large spatial scales, like the state of Idaho, even which is not even that big of a spatial scale compared to the globe, um, you know, we lost a lot of richness by having to use some of these proxy data sets. Um, I don't. I I would say that you could use, you know, social media. Technically, you know, you could use it across the globe, but, you know, obviously there's going to be so much variation and use in, in, in kind of how people are using it, how much people are using it, the ways in which they use it, all of these things. I mean, even, I don't know, that's hard. I don't know if we can. <laughs> Non-answer. And I guess it also depends on what we are measuring cultural benefits of or cultural, like, if it's like, we are interested in a species or a type of ecosystem that's like you don't have that at a global scale, but perhaps if you want to assess people's relationship with water and you then use that information for uh, advocating for clean water as a, I don't know, like human right and for decision makers to actually do something or their relationship with so, like something that is common at the global scale, I think that could work, but it would just be like a massive challenge, right? Because <laughs> Yeah, it's not something that they, there's data, data on. Oh, thank you for your answers. I know it was not fair to ask the question because I said I've been thinking about it for five years. But that means I plan to keep thinking about these questions and the more people that can help me think about it, the better. Um, I see wait, that. Wait, oh, I, yeah, can I ahead. just follow up one thing? I mean, I think if you wanted to have any proxy for cultural ecosystem services, it would be people. Like, are there people there? There's cultural services. Um, is is probably it's like number of people times infinity would be like your <laughs> your calculation, right? Awesome, thank you. I I see that there's still lots of questions in the chat that we don't have time to answer. So we'll try to follow up either by email or. Um, because I, I'm, I'm sorry, audience has been super engaged. That's great, but we don't have time. So I'm just gonna wrap this discussion. Um, yeah, so I want to say that this was the first session and we learned a lot today about, as I, as I mentioned before, two very complimentary talks on how to do this for water. And we have a new, another conversation coming up exactly two weeks from today, same time, same channel, about the ones tied to land with Nora uh, Feherholm, um, who is in Finland, and Elisa Oteros Rosas um, in Spain and Canada. So show up for the next version of these. And um, thank you so much to Rebecca, Rocio, and the NatCap staff for helping us uh, together, put together this talk. It was super interesting panel. Uh, I learned a lot, very good questions. So I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.